three hours, 30 minutes, until the massacre at Firth Asylum. John sprinted across the asylum parking lot, screaming, Shit! Black smoke poured through the house-sized hole that had been blown in the gymnasium wall. Screams and gunshots chased him. Nearby, a car windshield shattered. There was another explosion, and the shockwave threw John to the ground, scraping his palms on the pavement. Falconer grabbed the back of his shirt and yanked him to his feet. They made it to the Porsche parked a block away, and ten seconds later were tearing through the streets of Undisclosed, drawing the attention of every gun-toting spaceman they passed. And there were a lot of them. Clusters of them seemed to populate every corner. Falconer growled. That was liquid oxygen, dumbass. That's why those tanks had those huge orange warning stickers all over them. They use it in rockets. I didn't know. Jesus. You didn't know oxygen burns? Where did you go to school? Here. Look around. It's a shithole. The Porsche smashed through wooden barricades set up in the street. And on the other side was a ghost town. Broken glass in the streets. Garbage piled on the sidewalk. The Porsche turned down an alley and John realized that what was crunching under the tires like gravel were brass shell casings for machine guns. John said, Holy shit. Is everybody dead? There's a 24-hour curfew outside the green zone. Inside those barricades we drove through, they've still got military doing foot patrols. But out here, it's locked down. Nobody on foot. Just armored Humvees making sweeps every now and then. Anyone seen roaming the streets out here is presumed infected and either shot or hauled off to quarantine, depending on how far gone they are. Christ. How is that legal? Falconer shook his head. I have never seen anything like this in all my days. Everybody you see inside town, all hazmat suits, all the vehicles, that's all Reaper. Everybody else is withdrawn outside of town. If we turned right here, we'd eventually run into a Reaper cordon at city limits. Get past it, and you're in the dead zone. It's a five-mile-wide ring around the city where nobody is allowed. All the houses in that ring have been evacuated. All the businesses shut down. Reaper patrols it in armored vehicles. It acts as a vacuum seal between the city and the outside world. At the end of the dead zone, you'll find the National Guard. I'm talking tanks here. Rows of them. Guns aimed at the city like they expect Day of the Dead to come pouring out at them at any moment. Falconer pulled off into the yard of an abandoned house and parked in a spot behind the garage where the car wouldn't be visible from the street. He continued. But you see what they've done. What the outside world knows about what's going on in this town is only what Reaper tells them. There is no one else. All the phones are jammed. No news crews. No internet access. The military, they're on the other side of five miles of no man's land. Whatever the people are hearing, whatever the government is hearing, comes from Reaper. It's their show. John said. And I'm pretty sure at least one of the guys in charge is crazy. I'll agree with that assessment. Let's just say I've heard some shit about what goes on in that asylum. John said, Well, what now? We wait to make sure they're not still after us. I'm hoping the shitstorm you left behind back there makes us a low priority. 
They gotta get containment back in place first. John said. Can we get to Dave's place? Are they guarding it or anything? Why would they? (laughs) They would if they knew what was there. Falconer said. The drug, you mean. The soy sauce? Let me apologize ahead of time, detective. Because shit is about to get weird. Three hours, 15 minutes, until the massacre at Firth Asylum. Amy was about to explode. She didn't get mad often, and it took a lot. But once the pin on that grenade had been pulled, there was no containing it. This was something she had in common with David, though he didn't realize it. Amy's mom, back when she was alive, had said God had made sure to give her brother Jim all of the size and Amy all of the temper. He had been as big as a bear, but was always the voice of reason in an argument. The only time she had seen him in a fight, it was to defend her. Amy was literally less than half of his size, but had that grenade inside of her. Her mom called it her Irish, as in, Now calm down, your Irish is coming out. Which, ironically, made Amy furious. Wasn't that racist or something? But the look on Josh's face right now? It was about to get all Irish up in here. We have to go now. We should have left two hours ago. Fine, you don't care about David. You don't care if he gets eaten by a zombie or burned up to ashes. But who knows how many more are in there? Women? Kids? Who knows? We have to get them out. As many as we can. Josh, not making eye contact, said... I totally understand you're upset, but we have to be smart about this. Mike and Ricky aren't here. They're helping their families move before the quarantine swallows this whole place. And I told you about Zach. He's got food poisoning. He's already in bed. That's three guns were short. But tomorrow... (sighs) Oh, for the love of... You know what you are, all of you? Children. Little kids playing pretend with toys. You've spent years obsessing about this, and now it's here. Much to everyone's surprise, it's actually here. And it's tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Tomorrow, when the sun comes up? Tomorrow, when the weather's warmer? Tomorrow, when we have more help? When things aren't so bad? When everything is aligned just right so that there's no risk of anything bad possibly happening? Calm down. Screw you! Amy shrieked it, a sound that tore a hole in the air. Grenade, Amy. Watch it. You want to sit here in your little fantasy, your little suburban womb, with your laptop in your little clubhouse rubbing oil on your guns and congratulating yourself on how brave and strong you turned out to be in the stupid zombie war fantasies that play in your head. You're not a man. You're a boy. All of you. You're little boys because you choose to stay little boys. You don't become a man until you wake up one day and realize that today the world needs you to be a man. Josh, so help me. If you don't step up and become a man right now, people will die. Tonight. Not tomorrow. He didn't answer. He had his MacBook open and was fiddling around with the touchpad, and he had that look on his face that had pulled Amy's pen. A mask of feigned nonchalance. It took practice to come up with that look. Somebody who had been shamed so many times that he'd adapted to simply never showing it, rather than changing to not do things he was ashamed of. She wanted to slap him, 
and slap him and slap him. Amy, all I'm saying is... Amy bent over and screamed at the floor. She didn't know what else to do. Mom was right. If the Lord had given her Jim's body, she would have thrown this kid through the window of the RV. Fine, she said. All I want you to do is give me a ride down there. Drop me off at the barricades. I'll figure out a way to get across. I'll figure out a way to find David and anyone else who needs help in there. And I'll figure out a way to get them out. And if I don't, then I will die. And that's okay. Because while I'm dying trying to save the people I love, you'll be back here in your cocoon playing your zombie video games and jerking off and dying would be better than watching you do that. The side door of the RV ripped open. A short, dusky kid who Amy remembered was called Frito leaned in and said to Josh, Did you hear? I couldn't hear anything over her. Outbreak inside the Reaper Command Center. All hell broke loose. There was an explosion. The building's on fire. All their containment breached. Infected pouring out of their holding area. Holy shit. OGZA says fire trucks headed one way. Then 10 minutes later, Reaper were going the other, pulling out, leaving the green zone, leaving everything. They're pulling out of undisclosed. Looks like it. Amy said. So what does that mean? Josh said. It means all the manpower is now devoted to keeping anyone from leaving the city and anybody left behind is now on their own. Frito said. OGZA put out a call for assistance. Anybody and everybody with a gun. They said this is about to go from a class two to a class three zombie outbreak. Amy said. Is a class three the one where you guys actually do something? Frito said. They said they can get us inside the city. They got friends on the cordon. But that's only until the feds change the guard rotations. Josh hesitated studying the ridiculous collection of guns on the wall. Finally, he said, Tell everyone it's a go. The feds shit the bed, and now it's up to us. We roll in 30 minutes. Three hours until the massacre at Firth Asylum. John couldn't help but notice that while all of Undisclosed appeared to be the aftermath of a post-Super Bowl riot in Detroit, if you had woken up in Dave's neighborhood, you wouldn't have noticed any difference. Same old busted windows and same months-old trash bags sitting on porches. John found this comforting. The big change, of course, was where Dave's little 1,100-foot bungalow had previously stood. There now wasn't much of anything just a floor supporting the black frames of two burned-out walls and piles of wet, charred debris. Blackened drywall and two-by-fours and roofing and gnarled wiring. John really didn't feel anything about this, one way or the other. And not just because he had been the one to burn it down. John didn't get sentimental about houses. Maybe it was because he bounced around so much as a kid thanks to three different divorces. But he liked to think it just made more sense to not get attached to things. The memories didn't get burned up with a house or transferred to the new owners if it got sold. A house was just wood and nails. Falling in love with a house or a car or a pair of shoes, it was a dead end. You save your love for the things that can love you back. Falconer wanted the Porsche out of view, in case Reaper came by or somebody tried to steal the stereo or something. One of the abandoned houses down the street had left its garage door open, and Falconer pulled in. John personally thought it was wiser to have the car within lunging distance in case they needed to make a desperate getaway. But apparently, desperate getaways were what other people did in Falconer's world, 
while Falconer chased them and told them they had the right to remain silent. Once parked, John found the prospect of opening the car door and stepping out into the night erased any illusions he had that this was the same old neighborhood. In the rearview mirror, John saw curtains rustle in the dark house across the street. An infected? Or somebody hunkered down, scared that John and Falconer were infected? Who knows? If it was some terrified refugee crouched with a shotgun, John was hoping the Porsche would put them at ease. No zombie's going to drive a Porsche. There you go. With that zombie bullshit. They eased the heavy garage door down, closing it behind the Porsche. They headed down the sidewalk, at which point John thought he saw somebody slip around a corner, but then realized he didn't. He thought he heard footsteps, but it was a windy night, and the sound was a strand of Christmas lights from last year tapping against a window at the neighbor's place. Falconer asked. The soy sauce. Was it in the house when it burned? No. I'll show you. John was afraid Falconer would say, Great, I'll wait here. But instead, Falconer led the way, striding into Dave's yard like a man with a huge gun. Falconer glanced this way and that, alert, but not scared. John followed and made his way around the yard to find the tool shed hadn't burned. It was also still unlocked from when he'd grabbed the chainsaw the day everything went to shit. He reached inside and grabbed a shovel. He tossed it to Falconer. The sauce is in a little silver container, about the size of a spool of thread. Inside is a really thick black liquid. When we find it, don't open it. Not only will the shit kill you if it gets on your skin, but it will come after you. Have you seen the blob? It's like that, only tiny. And when you say it will kill you, you mean me, because you can handle it for some reason. Yeah, you'll see. Uh Uh-huh. And judging from the shovel, I assume you buried it. Yeah, around here somewhere. Don't look at me that way. I need you to do the digging. You'll see why. It's not deep. Now, the container is somewhere here in the backyard. I know where, but I'm not going to tell you. I want you to walk to a random spot. What you think is a random spot, anyway. And dig down about a foot. Falconer didn't move from where he was standing. He plunged the shovel into the dirt right in front of his feet. Three scoops, and then... Look. Right there. Falconer looked down, and in the moonlight saw the glint of brushed steel poking out from the mud. All right, how did you do that? I didn't. It did. The sauce. When we buried it, Dave just threw the shovel like a javelin and said, wherever it landed, that's where we'd bury it. That's where it landed, where you're standing. Because the soy sauce wanted it to land there. Because it knew you would be standing there a year later. It knew. So the sauce is alive. Yes, sir. And now you're going to swallow some of it? Yeah, that's the least painful way. Yeah. And you have no idea how it does what it does. Let's just say it's magic. Let's just say that I need a little more explanation than that if I'm going to go along with this. John sighed. Okay. Have you heard of nanotechnology? Yeah. Microscopic robots, right? Right. And imagine they can make millions of these robots and embed them in a liquid so that you now have a liquid infused with the power of all these machines. Got it? 
All right. Now imagine if, instead of tiny robots, it's magic. John dug the bottle from the mud with his fingers. Stand back. If you take that shit and you go into a seizure or cardiac arrest, I'm leaving you here. (laughs) Detective, if I take this shit and it looks like the trip is going bad, fucking run. John squeezed the bottle in his hand. He thought he heard the footsteps again, but decided he needed to stop falling for that at some point. He took a deep breath and said, All right, here it goes. Two hours, 45 minutes, until the massacre at Firth Asylum. Amy was rumbling through the night in a crowded RV, headed south, scared out of her mind. Her head was between her knees, staring at the filthy floor and praying silently, as had been her habit since she'd been a toddler. She had realized she was doing it out of reflex. If God was the type who needed to be asked verbally before he would support your side over man-eating monsters, then she wasn't sure what good he would be once he joined. She hadn't been to Mass since her brother Jim was alive. Her faith could be summed up in two sentences, from one of the Narnia books. Speaking about Aslan, the lion that symbolized Jesus, a character says, I'm on Aslan's side, even if there isn't any Aslan to lead it. I'm going to live as like a Narnian as I can, even if there isn't any Narnia. Amy hated, hated the way the grown-ups her parents had surrounded themselves with were so quick to offer prayers and so slow to actually do anything. Old women who barely left the house for anything but bingo and congratulated themselves on never drinking alcohol or saying dirty words, thinking God created humans to stay home and watch televangelists and just run out the clock until the day they die. Well, Amy figured you don't need more than five minutes on this planet to figure out that the one thing we do know about God, maybe the only thing, is that he favors those who act. David also believed that, though he didn't realize it. Guns were clicking all around her. The zombie nerds were pushing all variety of bullets into all varieties of gun parts. Long, gleaming brass bullets. Bright red shotgun shells. Guns designed with the elegant lines of sports cars. Slick, oiled metal and curved, textured plastic meant to fit right into your hand. Josh rammed a lever forward on his, and it clicked satisfyingly into place. Don't get it wrong. She saw the appeal. She also saw how you could start thinking of them as toys. Josh held up a blood-red shotgun shell and said, Dragon's breath. Zirconium-based incendiary pellets. Looks like a flamethrower every time you pull the trigger. This is an automatic shotgun with a 20-round drum. Three more drums in my backpack. We get in a jam. This thing will unleash a wall of hellfire as fast as I can pull the trigger. He clicked shells into a plastic drum the size of a large saucepan and said, These shells are $15 a piece, by the way. And there it was. She suddenly realized that she'd rather have David or John either one, armed with a baseball bat, than any of these guys and their video game hardware. David and John had a look in their eye when things went bad. A sad but resigned familiarity. They weren't trained for violence, and maybe weren't particularly competent at it, but they weren't going to go pee in the corner either. Both of them had come from bad homes, Both had gotten hit quite a bit as kids, and maybe that's all it was. Maybe they just understand something about the world and were more ready for it when things took a turn. She didn't see that look in any of these suburban kids. A couple of months ago, Amy had come to stay with David over the long Labor Day weekend. 
At around midnight on Friday night, a crazy guy started showing up. He knocked on the door and said he had a pizza. They hadn't ordered one, and he handed them this filthy pizza box, like something he dug out of the trash. David opened it, and it had dog poop in it. They called the police, but the guy was gone when they got there. The guy came back Saturday night. This time, the old pizza box had a dead squirrel in it. Dave threatened the guy, slammed the door in his face. The guy comes back at two in the morning, another pizza box. David doesn't even answer the door, just calls the police again. Again, no sign of the guy when they get there. At around 7 p.m. on Sunday, the crazy guy starts showing up once an hour. If they didn't answer, he'd stand there and ring the doorbell over and over and over. The third time, David goes to the door, and this time the guy says something to David through the closed door. Whatever he said, it made David open the door. They exchanged low, heated words, and the guy leaves a pizza box on the porch and walks away. David looked inside, closed it, and threw it in the trash barrel outside. He wouldn't tell Amy what was inside. As the man drove away, David yelled, You ever come within a hundred feet of her again, and I'm going to tear your throat out with my teeth. Only, there were a lot more curse words. But the guy did come back, at three in the morning, to their bedroom window. They were both fast asleep, and Amy slowly woke up and heard whispering, a foot from her head. And it's the crazy guy, whispering her name over and over. She screamed. David sprang out of bed, grabbed that ridiculous crossbow that John bought him at a gun show, and charged out of the house. David shoots the pizza guy in the chest and the guy goes down, screaming. But then comes the twist. The guy is carrying a fresh pizza from a local 24-hour pizza place in town. He works for them. The guy is wearing a clean, new uniform. He looks totally sane and acts completely shocked that he got attacked by a customer. The pizza was for a house down the street. He said he just went to the wrong door. After all of the legal craziness, with charges filed by the guy and talk of a civil suit for his medical bills, Amy asked David what they'd do if the guy came back some night in crazy mode. David's answer? I hit him someplace where I know it'll be fatal. And he would, even if it meant jail. He would do it for her. A kid in the back was trying on a pair of night vision goggles. There were eight people packed into the RV. Frito was driving. About 150 people counted themselves among the zombie response squad when the wave of zombie panic hit the university. Seven answered the call when it came time to actually meet the threat. All of them piled in the RV with Amy, clacking the mechanisms on their guns. Amy was scared out of her mind, but she would push through the fear and finish this. And she would have to hope the men sitting around her would do the same. Amy had read the Lord of the Rings trilogy four times and was starting on her fifth. There was a bit she had memorized when the Ents were marching off to war against seemingly impossible odds. All odds probably seemed against you when you were a big, ridiculous walking tree. It was running through her head now and would keep looping from now until they arrived at Undisclosed. Of course... It is likely enough, my friends, that we are going to our doom, the last march of the Ents. But if we stayed at home and did nothing, doom would find us anyway, sooner or later. Yes, Amy had long ago made peace with the fact that she was a huge, 
flaming nerd. Soy sauce. John twisted the silver bottle. It separated in the middle, along a seam that was invisible when it was closed. He didn't open it all the way. He learned that wasn't always wise if the soy sauce was awake. A thin black stream leaked out from the crack. It looked like a length of heavy black string had come and spooled. John laid his index finger under the seam to catch it. Then, several things happened all at once. First, the shuffling footsteps John thought he had been hearing got louder and faster. They had a hollow tone, like someone stomping around on the floor above your apartment. John and Falconer both spun, looking for the source. Then, something leaped off the neighbor's roof, sailing through the air like a huge, weaponized flying squirrel coming right down on Falconer. John's brain had a tenth of a second to try to register what he was really seeing when the soy sauce made its move. At the exact same moment, John's mouth was forming the words. Falconer, look! The thin black string of sauce coiled around on its own like a snake. In a blink, whipping around his finger, over his fingernail, and digging into his skin right at the sensitive spot where a hangnail would form. Pain flashed up John's hand, all the way to his elbow. Then, the soy sauce took hold, and the world disappeared. Dave once described taking a hit of soy sauce as like digging up one of those thick fiber optic lines that feeds an entire city's internet connection and plugging it into your brain. All those streams of data crashing into your neurons at once, so hard and fast that you simultaneously know everything and nothing at all. John always thought his own description was clearer It's like an insane clown posse concert, where all 50,000 members of an audience are given their own microphone and sound system, and they all start simultaneously improvising bad freestyle rap verses. John was introduced to the stuff at a party, where he was barely old enough to legally drink, and had been drinking for eight years. It was given to him by a black dude from Ohio doing a fake Jamaican accent, the guy who would later be found with his gut splattered on the wall of his trailer. The fucker got off easy. It was the same sensation this time as the first. Soy sauce was not something you built up a tolerance for. Everything stopped. John was yanked out of his body, out of the world, mind freed from the confines of his eyes and ears and nose and mouth and a trillion nerve endings. A wash of alien sensations crashed over him, like being naked at the bottom of a frantic orgy involving everyone in that Star Wars cantina scene. John found that he was suddenly somewhere else. He was standing among bombed-out buildings, avalanches of brick and wood and glass flung across the streets. Weeds growing up through cracks in the asphalt. He had leapt forward in time. He didn't know how much. He looked around, or rather, his view panned around, as he didn't seem to have eyes to look with. Devastation and broken structures littering the landscape into the horizon and beyond. He saw that the rubble was crawling with life. Small skittering things. John walked, or rather, his view floated, toward the remains of a shattered church. A rotting human head crawled across a pile of ragged concrete, the legs of a parasite jutting below the jaw. 
the parasite wearing the moldering skull like a hermit crab's shell. Another head trundled by, then another. Then another set of spider legs skittered by, this time trailing a tangled wad of guts. They were everywhere. John looked around, again without turning a head or a set of eyes, and saw the streets were littered with broken and charred corpses, flies buzzing over spilled guts, the head of an old woman, eyes having long rotted out of their sockets, the skull bearing a blunt trauma wound, came wobbling by. The parasite inside opened its mouth and emitted that bone-rattling shriek. A moment later, a second head and parasite came trundling behind it. They started humping. Then it was gone. John yanked back across time. And now he was in the sky, trees and homes whipping by underneath him. He saw rows of military trucks forming thick layers on either side of the fence, the cordon circling city limits. He flew away from it, zipping up the highway. Suddenly, he was inside of an RV, and there was Amy, sitting with a bunch of dudes carrying guns. She was sticking her hand in a box of golden grams, eating them dry like they were potato chips. John tried to speak to her, but of course he wasn't really there. Focus. Focus on getting back. And then the world was twisting and flowing around him, the scenery stretching past until he found himself back at Dave's burned-out house, back in his own body, staring at Falconer and the unholy thing that had jumped down at him from the rooftop above. The scene was frozen before him. John saw that the leaping monster was transforming grotesquely in midair, Falconer still not having so much as tilted his head up to see it. The leaves at their feet were no longer blowing, and the world had gone utterly silent. Time had simply stopped. John looked down at his hands and realized that he could move his fingers, realized that time had not stopped for him, but only the rest of the world. John took a tentative step, found that he could move with no problem. Then he looked around, put his hands on his hips, and in the stillness said, Huh. This particular thing had never happened to John on soy sauce before, but that was par for the course because the same thing never happened twice. Out-of-body experiences, time travel, interdimensional travel, invisibility? Yes. Stopping time? No. No. He'd have to tell Dave. If he remembered, that is. Unfortunately, the godlike status you sometimes achieved under soy sauce, however briefly, was kind of like the boost in sexual confidence you got from beer. Nice while you're in the moment. But the next day, you don't remember shit. He tried to get over the initial shock of what was going on and assess the situation. Who knew how long the effect would last? and when time would suddenly burst forward again. Falconer was frozen in place ten feet in front of John, a statue that looked like it was built to pay tribute to good style and bewildered expressions. Suspended in midair, two feet above him, was a monster. John could kind of see where it had been a man once, before the parasite did its work, but it took a few minutes. Wait, did it? Did minutes exist? The creature's arms and legs both were spread straight out, so that the limbs and torso formed a sideways H. Along the arms and legs, both were sharp, pointed protrusions of bone, so that the limbs were serrated like a knife. It was easy to see its method of attack. In half second of real time, it would wrap the limbs around Falconer's neck and torso, and with one brutal squeeze, leave him in three distinct bloody chunks. 
there was no time for Falconer to react. He was simply not going to survive the attack without intervention. John walked toward him and thought the ground felt different. It took him a moment to realize that the grass wasn't bending under his feet, like he was walking on titanium astroturf. His shoes were sticking with each step, where blades of grass were pricking the soles like needles. John went to grab the shovel from where Falconer had stabbed it into the ground and realized he could not move it, not even to wiggle it back and forth. So, it was like that. Time was frozen, but it was truly frozen. John couldn't actually impact the world in any way. He couldn't kill the monster, or even push Falconer out of harm's way. Well, shit. What good was this? Actually, he could find out if Dave was alive. No, he couldn't leave here. At any moment, the soy sauce would wear off. Time could resume, and Falconer would be on his own to deal with the creature swooping down on his head. Or, rather, not deal with it. He likely wouldn't even comprehend what was happening before his severed skull was rolling in the dead leaves of Dave's yard. The man was good, but not that good. And so, the venture with the soy sauce had all been a big, stupid waste. Getting out of the asylum building, coming here, all of it. When things returned to normal, Falconer would get splattered. John would be on his own. And he would be no closer to fixing things than he was the moment he woke up hungover in the frat house earlier. Well, whatever. John walked over next to Falconer and positioned himself behind, with his hands on Falconer's back. John leaned forward, all of his weight on the man's back. Falconer didn't move, of course. It was like leaning on a bronze statue. So, that at the moment time returned to normal, Falconer would be shoved instantly out of harm's way. At the same time, John would fall to the ground, and hopefully... This would thwart the monster long enough that they could do... something. John waited. And waited. Time remained frozen. A couple of hours later, John was sitting on the prickly, petrified grass in front of Falconer, annoyed wondering precisely how long he should babysit this situation instead of striking out and trying to do something else. Finally, he got bored and made his way to the street, walking toward the hospital quarantine. What else was there to do? John walked through Dave's neighborhood and out into the life-size undisclosed diorama. At one point, he painfully banged his shin on a discarded newspaper that was in the middle of being blown by a gust of wind when time stopped. There were a few stationary vehicles on the roads, not many with the curfew. John figured the uninfected were living the life of refugees in a war zone, hunkered down with the kids in the basement, hoping that the sounds of all hell breaking loose on their block wouldn't be followed by the sound of their front door getting smashed in. Out of curiosity, John approached a beat-up pickup truck frozen in the middle of the street, a cloud of exhaust hanging perfectly still in the air behind it. The bed was full of cardboard boxes, cases of toilet paper and diapers. The driver was an elderly black man with a shotgun laying across his lap. His hand was stuck halfway to the ashtray, two inches of cigarette between thumb and index finger a curling ribbon of smoke hanging frozen over it. John reached his hand in through the driver's side window and tried to push his finger through the frozen smoke. It was solid as a rock. Weird. John strolled across town and made his way to the hospital. His footsteps were utterly silent. 
The quiet here was less like a library and more like having earplugs. Sound waves unable to move through the air, apparently. John thought he could hear his own blood sliding through his veins and his digestion gurgling away. He wondered how long it would be until that drove him insane. The hospital was now a POW camp. The grounds were surrounded by the kind of high fence you'd see on a maximum security prison, razor wire at the top and everything. Outside of the fence were concrete barriers they dropped in to keep somebody from getting the bright idea to just ram through the fence with a truck. Yet, John found no human guards on the outside. Were they all in bed? Instead, stationed every 200 feet or so, was a driverless vehicle. On the back of each was a turret, two thin barrels on each side of a cylinder, outfitted with a bank of lenses. Mechanical eyes, with radar, infrared, or thermal imaging like the Predator. This place was totally being guarded by robotic sentry guns. Badass. John had come hoping he could just get a look into the yard. If Dave was alive and outside, and if John could get a glimpse of him, that would be enough. But they had covered the damned fence and tarps that, inexplicably, were all printed with misspelled advertisements. Blocking the section of fence in front of him was a huge billboard that said, Try the Black Anus Quarter Pounder. He should have known it wouldn't be that easy. John walked all the way around the fencing, a trip that took him at least an hour, or zero time, depending on how you looked at it. That raised the question in John's mind as to whether or not time would ever resume to normal speed. What would he do if it just stayed this way forever? Take up a hobby? John didn't find an obvious way into the quarantine. He had been hoping that somebody had been walking through an open gate at the exact moment time stopped, and climbing the fence would be no easier in freeze frame than it would be at normal speed. In fact, the coils of razor wire would be worse in this state of absolute rigidity. John had a vivid image of himself falling into that wire, the blades slicing through his abdomen and shredding his intestines, and John staying like that writhing in the razors, unable to free himself, unable to die, for all of eternity. John completed his circuit and made it around to the front gate again. John noticed a frozen pillar of smoke that had been drifting horizontally over the fence in the wind and figured maybe the inmates were all standing around a campfire roasting weenies or something. If he could just get up high enough to see over the fence. Boom. Trees right behind him. They looked fairly climbable. It occurred to John halfway up that this would have been impossible two months earlier. The frozen in time leaves would have sliced him open just as effectively as the razor wire. But this was mid-November and he had bare branches to grab onto. He was making good progress right up until he banged his head into an invisible force field. Hanging above him was a gray haze, and he finally realized it was the plume of smoke from the campfire, pushed over the fence by a gust of wind that John obviously could not feel. He rerouted himself to get past it, and now at a height where he could easily break his neck if he fell, and lay writhing and screaming, unheard in the eternity between moments. He suddenly realized that the plume of campfire smoke formed an imperfect bridge right over the fence and into the quarantine. Fighting every possible sense of balance and self-preservation, John steadied himself on the gray haze and walked over the fence, trying to keep his eyes forward and not on the impossibly flimsy 
transparent bridge he was edging across. The footing wasn't bad, though. The tiny suspended particles of ash had a rough texture, like walking on a huge bar of lava soap. The plume got uncomfortably narrow as he got closer to the fire, and as soon as he passed over the fences, he had to get down on his hands and knees and crawl. He jumped to the ground because it seemed like a bad idea to walk into the glowing embers of a dying bonfire, even if it was frozen in time. He had no idea how that worked. No longer focusing on trying not to fall on his head, he finally had time to register what was going on in the yard. There were dozens of people in red and green jumpsuits. Well, shit. He didn't see why the situation in here was any worse than out in town. Nobody had a monster hovering over them and they were all safely behind a fence, guarded by robots. If Dave was here and alive, then it seemed like a best case scenario. Then, John happened to glimpse what was being burned in the fire pit and thought, Oh. John tore his gaze away from the bones and the ash. He had caught himself trying to count the skulls in there and was up to 62 when he stopped and started moving through the still life of the wax dummy quarantine. None of the people standing in the yard were Dave, so he headed for the hospital itself. Fortunately, the door was propped open, so he wasn't going to have to figure out some convoluted way in. Dave! There, next to the main entrance of the hospital... John almost missed him because he was bent over, paused in the middle of tying his shoe. He had an open can of beans sitting on the ground next to him, a little plastic spoon sticking out. And there was Molly, standing next to him, poised to start eating the beans, with Dave's attention diverted. A dam burst inside of John, a river of relief crashing through him so hard. He almost collapsed. Dave was alive. Somehow. His friend was pale and had lost some weight. A lot of it. And while Dave could stand to lose some weight, he had lost it because he was in a prison camp against his will, eating cold beans and shit. Packed in here with other dudes he almost certainly hated by now. Cut off standing among garbage and broken windows and burning corpses, because they had left him here. Because John had left him here. And then another dam burst, this time unleashing a black tide of self-hatred that was poised to come crashing over the sandcastle of John's mind. But he held it at bay, knowing this was no time to let things go dark in his head. He wanted a drink. Later. For now, he was going to take a shot. Dave, said John, and the words seemed to die right in front of him, swallowed into the stillness of the paused world. It was like the little pocket of time that let John move around ended two inches in front of his face, and that's all the sound could travel. He leaned in closer and said, Dave, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm coming. Be ready. Stay near the fence. If anything I'm saying is capable of sinking in, let it be that. Wait for the sound of shit hitting the fan. No reaction from Dave, of course. John tried to think of something else that could be accomplished while he was here, but he imagined time suddenly resuming while he was standing here, so that the end result of the whole project would be that he was now trapped inside the quarantine, with Amy out there trying to rescue both of them. Falconer would be in several bloody chunks. John headed to the smoke bridge, followed it back over the fence, and nearly killed himself trying to transition from the solid smoke to the tree branches. But he eventually made it to the ground, landing with a jolt on the immovable grass, and started making his way back to Dave's house. 
John's route took him past the asylum, the main building now with a huge hole in the side that was leaking smoke. And then he saw something that almost made him shit himself. Shadows. Walking shadows. This was no trick of the light. These were bona fide shadow men, just like he'd seen in the hospital security video, just as Dave saw in his bedroom recently, just as random folks around Undisclosed had been reporting off and on for as far back as written records were kept, and they were moving. The former Firth TB Asylum, and now former Outbreak Command Center for Reaper, was filthy with the shadow men. Moving, twisting through the air. Not frozen like everything else. One thing John knew about the shadows is that they were unbound by time, which is what made them unspeakably dangerous. Well, that and the fact that they were assholes. John ran. He made it two blocks before he took a bullet to the shoulder and spun to the ground. That's what it felt like anyway. Something had torn open his shirt and left a red gash underneath. He scrambled to his feet, looking around for a gunman. Finally, he looked back the way he came and saw his assailant. A moth, frozen in midair. Tiny, fragile, yet utterly unmovable. John pressed on, toward Dave's house, slower this time, glancing back over his wounded shoulder for trailing shadows. Back in Dave's yard now, which was unfortunately exactly how he'd left it, with a deformed motherfucker swooping down on Falconer, ready to saw his body into pieces. This was incredibly frustrating. He had as long as he wanted to form a plan, but since the only thing he could move was his own body, this advantage amounted to nothing more than the ability to throw himself into the monster's jaws instead of Falconer. Even now, he saw how stupid his idea had been earlier, to try to just shove Falconer out of the way. They'd both wind up on the ground, with the beast on top of them. All he'd be doing is supersizing the monster's lunge, John wondered if he had stuffed a weapon in his pocket before he froze time, if he'd be free to use it. After all, his clothes moved with him. (laughs) Ah, there we go. He did have something. From Falconer's point of view, John stood in front of him and started to open his little silver pill bottle. Then, John got a momentary look of panic on his face, shouted, Falconer, look! And suddenly blinked out of existence. At the exact same moment, a growling, shrieking, inhuman mass of thrashing limbs fell onto Falconer's back, flinging him to the grass. Falconer rolled over and whipped out his sidearm in one motion. What was in front of him was a spastic tableau of absurdity. A grossly deformed, once-human monster was rolling around, howling in frustration. It had four jagged limbs full of huge white teeth that it was trying to whip through the air to slash anything in the vicinity. It couldn't, though because it was restrained by lengths of cloth that knotted the limbs behind its back like handcuffs. Standing over this flailing, shrieking beast was John, in tiny black jockey shorts, screaming, Yeah! Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! Falconer kicked away from the monster and got to his feet. John looked at him and yelled, What are you waiting for? Shoot him in the mouth! The word mouth could not be heard over the gunshots. 
A minute later, John, heart pounding and breathless, untied his pants from the twitching beast and pulled them on. Falconer was reloading. Falconer had put six bullets in the creature's maw, but John had no idea what it took to kill a spider. The only one he'd ever successfully killed was the one he drowned with the turkeys. Glancing nervously at the creature, John suddenly remembered the real reason he had made Falconer bring him here. He said, The box. What? The green box. Get it out of the tool shed and let's get the hell out of here. Falconer ran to the shed and said, Not here. Shit. They took it. No, wait. Dave put it in the trunk of the caddy while I was burning the house. We have to find it. What would they have done with an abandoned car? We left my Cadillac at the burrito place. If it was blocking traffic, they'd have impounded it. Maybe. Who knows? Why do we need the box? Trust me, we need it. Or rather, we need it to not wind up in the hands of somebody else. Ugh, wait. Damn it. What? It just occurred to me that I could have written Dave a message on a wall using my own shit. Falconer didn't ask for clarification on this. He just jogged down toward the garage that held the Porsche, with John in tow. This time, John knew he was hearing footsteps. Fast steps. A lot of them. Out of breath, John hissed. Detective! I hear it move. It took both of them to open the garage door. It was old and the springs were busted, which meant it was heavy as hell without the lift system to help. John was left to keep it propped over his head while Falconer ran in to start the car. Footsteps. A stampede. Something had been roused in the night, probably by the sound of the gunshots. John whipped his head around, squinting in the night. Nervous mists of breath puffing into the night air. A crowd rounded the corner, blocking the street. Dozens and dozens of shambling figures, so many that no light slipped between them. Detective. The zombies approached fast, coming up the street like a tide. John turned and saw that they were coming from the opposite direction, too, converging like a hammer and anvil. The Porsche started, and John was calculating the time it would take Falconer to back out, stop, let John in, pull into the street, and plow through the crowd. The tires were flat. It was so dark in the garage he almost didn't notice. Both of the back tires had been slashed, Shredded, in fact. And John was going to guess the same went for the front. He was about to tell Falconer this, but at that moment, John felt something touch his face. A caress, like a finger. Only, it was definitely not a fucking finger. That was all it took. John cursed and ducked inside the garage, the door slammed shut, sealing them off from all light. Detective, your tires? Shit. From inside the car. What? Get in! No, we... Falconer flipped on the headlights, lighting up the interior of the garage. There was a giant... Daddy Longlegs Spider, covering the entire inner surface of the garage door, easily eight feet across. 
where the body of the spider would normally be was a human face. The creature jumped. <laughs>